So it's 4.02, let's go ahead and get started. Again, welcome. Uh, my name is Ted Clement, Executive Director of Save Mount Diablo, and welcome to our Honoring the Past, Inspiring the Future Zoom Lecture Series. For those who might be new to Save Mount Diablo, we are a nationally accredited nonprofit land trust formed on December 7th, 1971 in the East Bay section of the San Francisco Bay Area. We have a mission to protect the important open space lands associated with Mount Diablo and the mountain's connection to its sustaining Diablo range. To create lasting public benefits for our communities and local flora and fauna, we use various tools like land acquisition, advocacy, education, and land stewardship. In the vein of honoring the past, inspiring the future, Save Mount Diablo's board of directors approved a land acknowledgement statement at their board retreat this past January. It reads as follows. Save Mount Diablo recognizes that we are on the unceded ancestral lands of the Bay Miwok, Muwekma Ohlone, Northern Valley Yukats, and other tribes and tribelets, peoples who have loved and cared for Mount Diablo as a sacred mountain since time immemorial. Many of these peoples continue today as thriving members of the diverse communities of the greater San Francisco Bay Area in the larger Diablo Range region. We acknowledge and honor the Bay Miwok, Ohlone, and Northern Valley Yukut tribes, as well as all of the indigenous people of the lands which Save Mount Diablo serves. We're in the midst of our 50th anniversary celebrations, which will continue through December 7, 2022. As part of the celebrations, we are doing various special events and activities. For this year long celebration of our 50th, we have rebranded our Nature Heals and Inspire Zoom lecture series into Honoring the Past, Inspiring the Future. We are also offering some 50th anniversary themed free public educational outings in our Discover Diablo program. We are doing an oral history with UC Berkeley's Oral History Center of the Bancroft Library, and we're doing other related events like a big and special Moonlight on the Mountain party, celebrating our 50th at China Wall in Mount Diablo State Park on Saturday, September 10th. Mark your calendars for what is going to be a great gala and check our website for more details. When Save Mount Diablo was formed in 1971, Mount Diablo was home to just one 6,000 788-acre park, Mount Diablo State Park. Today, there are more than 50 parks and preserves around the mountain north of Altamont Pass, totaling over 120,000 conserved acres. And Mount Diablo State Park has grown to about 20,000 acres in size. Thankfully, because of Save Mount Diablo and our generous supporters and good partners, Mount Diablo and its foothills are one of the Bay Area's most significant assemblages of natural lands and wildlife habitats. Few realize when they look toward Mount Diablo, however, that the beautiful vistas they see are not fully preserved. Over 60,000 additional acres of natural lands on and surrounding the mountain north of Altamont Pass are in private ownership and are threatened by development or other land uses. Mount Diablo is the northern part of the Diablo Range, which extends for over 200 miles through 12 counties. The Diablo Range is a biodiversity hotspot and an important wildlife habitat corridor. So there is a reason why we see so many golden eagles in the Mount Diablo area. The Diablo Range has the highest concentration of golden eagles on the planet. In other words, Mount Diablo is sustained and supported by its Diablo range. For this reason, Save Mount Diablo expanded its geographic scope further south into the Diablo range to help ensure that Mount Diablo will not get cut off from its sustaining Diablo range due to things like overdevelopment and bad planning. This expansion is especially important in this time of the climate crisis and mass species extinction events. Thanks to our supporters and terrific Save Mount Diablo team, we started 2022 with great momentum. In January, we permanently conserved almost 154 acres on the slopes of Mount Diablo's North Peak with the Concord Mount Diablo Trail Ride Association. 
Then in February, we won an important lawsuit where we challenged the city of Pittsburgh's approval of the Sino owned Discovery Builders 1,650 unit Perea development project, a massive project proposed to be built on the hills between Concord in Pittsburgh above the site for the new Thurgood Marshall Regional Park that we advocated for over many years. In February, we also learned that our discussions with the Semex Corporation over the past six years were successful as the company just agreed and announced that they will protect an important 101 acre parcel contiguous with Mount Diablo State Park. At the end of March, we opened our free public Mangini Ranch Educational Preserve the first of its kind in Contra Costa County. Our educational preserve affords intimate and educational experiences in nature to one group at a time. It is open free of charge to a variety of groups pursuing educational purposes, such as a high school science class, an adult education, nature photography course, a yoga class, a plein air artist gathering, a trail running club, an elementary school field trip, or an addiction recovery group. Our educational preserve at our Mangini Ranch is run with an online application and reservation system. So go to our website for more details. Thankfully, because of great supporters like all of you and others, we know we can continue our terrific conservation momentum and success. Today, we have a gift of gratitude for you, a special presentation by a special presenter. Scott Hines' presentation about Save Mount Diablo's 15 years of its bio blitz findings. Science is an important part of our DNA at Save Mount Diablo, and our annual bio blitz is an expression of that. Scott is a local business owner, a scientist, a talented photographer, an active outdoor enthusiast, and a long serving Save Mount Diablo board member. Scott, I just want to thank you for all of your contributions to Save Mount Diablo over many years and for also for providing this educational gift of gratitude to our supporters today. So take it away, Scott, and enjoy everyone. Great, thank you so much, Ted. I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Okay, so the topic of my presentation today is 15 years of bio blitzes that confirm uh, the Diablo Range's rich biodiversity. First, I'd like to thank um, Save Mount Diablo staff who organized the bio blitz and also provided me with a summary of results for the 15 years of bio blitzes I'm going to be discussing today. In particular, Sean Burke, Roxana Lucero, Denise Castro and Haley Sutton from our stewardship and, and land department um, have been instrumental uh, both last year and this year in organizing and, and carrying out our bio blitzes. Say Mount Diablo held our first bio blitz in 2007 on our Irish Canyon property. We believe that it was the first bio blitz held in the Bay Area and we've had one ever, every year since then. During my presentation, I hope to give you a sense of what happens during our typical bio blitz and also do my best to summarize the last 15 years in the time we have available. Finally, we'll give you a quick preview of the 2022 public bio blitz. So what is a bio blitz? In a bio blitz, you try to identify as many species of living things as you can within a specific geography during a defined period of time. And typically it's uh, been 24 hours, a 24 hour uh, period. Although we've changed this approach a little bit as a result of the pandemic and the expansion of our area of interest into the Diablo range. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So for a, a BioBlitz to be successful, you wanna have as many scientists and experts to participate as you can in order to fully document the biodiversity of the study area. I'm a birder. And so I'm usually focused on finding birds during the bio blitz, although I have lots of other interests, flowers and plants and, and herps and things like that. However, I also know that the way you improve as a naturalist is to spend time in the field with experts. And the, for me, the bio blitz is a great opportunity to do that. Uh, spend time with people who are really passionate about wild things um, in, in these wild places. 
So Irish Canyon was the first strategic acquisition by Save Mount Diablo in the corridor between Black Diamond Mines Regional Preserve and Mount Diablo State Park. We returned to this area in 2013 again and held the bio blitz on the Thomas and Barron properties, which are adjacent to Irish Canyon. And today these properties are part of what will be a brand new 5,000 acre regional park, effectively doubling the size of Black Diamond Mines Regional Preserve. Our first bio blitz at Irish Canyon in 2007 allowed us to collect important information about the natural resources in this area and help make the case for protection of the entire corridor to Mount Diablo. And as I mentioned, we believe this was the first bio blitz held in the Bay Area. I'd first like to give you a brief idea of what a bio blitz day looks like as a participant using some photos I took from that very first bio blitz in 2007. We typically start the 24 hour clock in the afternoon on Friday, and this allows us time to make preparations. So preparations might be something like placement of live mammal traps, which are left undisturbed overnight. Camera traps are also installed temporarily uh, as our insect traps. There's usually time for some additional investigations, birding and scouting before dark. And then many bio blitz participants camp on site in order to, to be able to search for nocturnal species and to save time reaching the study site in the morning. And then participants are usually up before dawn on Saturday morning. And as I was when I captured this photo of the sunrise over the Sierra, reflecting off the Delta and the ridges of Black Diamond Mines Regional Preserve on the morning of the 2013 bio blitz. This is uh, Save Mount Diablo board member and former president and biologist Malcolm Sprawl and his colleagues from LSA Associates checking the live mammal traps first thing in the morning. Particularly with the, with the live mammal traps, it's important that you count and find every trap that you placed the day before so that you don't leave a trap that could either catch an animal uh, later or that has a live animal in it um, that might perish if you, if you don't remember where your traps are. So very careful about counting and finding. And then sometimes you get lucky and a trap has sprung as occupied. The animal's identified. And then critically important, you release them safely back to the same location where it was found. The participants then head out into the field to identify, identify all the plants, insects, animals, uh, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and other living things they can find. Now, what you, what you find is that many things can impact the species count. The time of year that we choose to do the bio blitz will favor some species over others. Weather on the day of the bio blitz can impact things. For example, cold, rainy weather is generally bad for insects. And then probably the most important is how many experts in, in different fields of study are able to participate. Obviously, if you don't have any entomologists uh, participating, your um, insect count is going to be very low. But then of course, sometimes it's just plain old luck being in the right place at the right time. And I'll show an example of that in a second. So all the participants head out into the field and uh, count everything they can find and then head back to the base camp uh, for a late lunch, usually around two o'clock in the afternoon to discuss and report on their findings. With some species, more effort can be required to make uh, definitive identifications. I believe this is Kip Will from the Essex Museum of Entomology at Cal, working at sorting and identifying beetles in the field. You can see he has a microscope set up to help with those identifications. And so our, for our first bio blitz in Irish Canyon, we had 16 experts participate. And those 16 experts identified 297 uh, total species, 10 mammals, 60 birds, four reptiles, three amphibians, 52 invertebrates, and 168 plants. And the invertebrate number was in particular low, um, partly because of the weather. It was cold and rainy. 
and also because I don't believe we had very many entomologists participating that first year. And I should say that um, when I mentioned the word expert, that really means any participant who has expertise in one of the fields that are important to a biologist. They could be professional biologists, they could be prof professors uh, and their students, and then also expert uh, knowledgeable naturalists. So here are a couple of notable species found on that first bio blitz. Uh, this is deltoid balsam root, which is a lo locally rare uh, flower. And this is one that I actually found, which is a solitary sandpiper, which is an un uncommon migrant shorebird. And I found this at, at a big stock pond that's, that's on the Irish Canyon property. This species nests in the Arctic and spends the winter primarily in Mexico and Central and South America. So the only time we see them in California is during migration. And rather than finding this shorebird on mudflats at the shore, it's often found in places like this, a relatively small stock pond like the one in Irish Canyon. And it's also well-named. You usually find individual solitary birds. And this is an example of that luck factor I talked about. I just happened to check this pond at the end of the day. Um, I almost didn't, but I went back because I had checked it earlier in the day. I went back and checked again and this bird had dropped in to, to rest and refuel on its way north. So that was a combination of knowing what to look for and knowing where to look, and then just being lucky that I happened to see it because it probably didn't stay there very long. So moving on uh, to say Mount Diablo's Mangini Ranch, uh, it's located adjacent to Lime Ridge open space, space between Concord and Walnut Creek. And as Ted just mentioned, uh, the, we have the exciting news that we just opened our first pub public educational preserve at Mangini Ranch. We closed escrow on our purchase of, of Mangini Ranch in 2007 and held our first bio blitz here in 2008, which was timely. We then um, in 2018 held a bio blitz on private ranch land adjacent to Mangini, that's the Ginocchio family's Royal Del Cerro Ranch, and then returned to this area again in 2019, uh, in part due to a wildfire that occurred the previous summer in Lime Ridge open space. So we have three years of, of data for um, this particular area. Mangini Ranch has uh, one of the northernmost stands of desert olive scrub habitat, which is the habitat in bright green at the center of, of the, uh, the slide here. This area down in here is the desert olive scrub habitat. Also take note of the chaparral slopes on the ridge behind the desert olive. You may already know the story of the Mount Diablo buckwheat. It had been observed by Dr. Mary Bowerman, one of Save Mount Diablo's founders in 1936, and not after that, and was presumed to be extinct. Then in 2005, graduate student Mike Park discovered a small population at the edge of chaparral in Mount Diablo State Park. Botanists began searching similar habitat around the mountain to try and find additional populations. In fact, we organized a number of, of what we called find the buckwheat days in promising locations in the years after the discovery. One of the historic uh, populations that had been documented by Save Mount Diablo founder, Dr. Mary Bowerman was on the chaparral slopes you see in, in these photos in the Mangini Ranch area. So you can imagine there was a great interest in searching these slopes and those in adjacent Lime Ridge open space for the Mount Diablo buckwheat. One of the things that, you some, that sometimes happens when you have talented, knowledgeable people searching an area carefully for one species is that they find something else unexpected. While the Mount Diablo buckwheat has yet to, to have been refound in this area, another two plant species discover, were discovered by botanist David Gowan nearby in Lime Ridge open space and then redocumented during the bio blitz. These two plants were previously unidentified and re represented entirely new species. One of those was the Lime Ridge Navaretia, Navaretia goenii. It's lo located uh, in Lime Ridge open space and has also been documented from a couple of locations in San Benito County and, and uh, Stanislaus County. This is the Lime Ridge Ariastrum. Uh, Ariastrum erderae, named for Barbara Erder, who was the co-author of the second edition of the Flowering Plants and Ferns of Mount Diablo with Mary Bowerman. As far as we know, this plant is endemic to Lime Ridge open space. It's the only place on earth that it's found. 
And this also shows how important it can be to protect even relatively urban open spaces like Lime Ridge open space. Another plant, interesting plant that's found on Mangini Ranch that we found during the Bio Blitz is Hospital Canyon Larkspur. This is a rare delphinium that grows with the desert olive on Mangini. And it's only found in a handful of locations in the Diablo range. Hospital Canyon Larkspur grows to over six feet tall some years. You can see these are very tall specimens in the photo. In fact, the first time we toured the Mangini Ranch before we purchased the property and saw these plants, we thought they might be escaped garden plants. Uh, another interesting species found on the Bioblitz is Coast Horned Lizard, which is what it was called at the time, now called Blaineville's Horned Lizard. And it was found in Lime Ridge open space. This species is also in decline due to habitat loss, but fortunately Lime Ridge open space and nearby Mount Diablo State Park are refu refuges for this very cool species. Moving to the Ginocchio's Royal Del Cerro property. This is Doug Bell from East Bay Regional Park District and Patrick Kohler from the uh, US Geologic Survey searching for golden eagles during the 2018 bio blitz, which they did find. Um, and Patrick is doing a long-term study of, of uh, golden eagles in the Diablo range. White globe lily was found on Royal Del Cerro. This is a much less common in our area than the endemic uh, yellow Mount Diablo globe lily. And the endemic Mount Diablo sunflower. And the aptly named most beautiful jewel flower, which is um, a fairly unusual plant in our area. So in, in 2008, the Mangini BioBlitz, we had uh, 25 experts and 16 in 2007, so a few more in, in 2008. Um, we had 297 species in 2007 and 583 species uh, in 2008. And that, that may just be, that could be due to the weather. It could be due to the number of additional experts who may have covered additional, um, additional uh, areas of, of knowledge. And then in 2019, in Royal Del Cerro, we had 88 experts and 419 species. And those 88 experts are the highest number of participating, of participants we've had from all our bio blitzes so far. And I think it was probably due to a couple of combinations, one being interest in being able to study and access this private ranch, which is a, a spectacular ranch, and also because of the relative accessibility of, of Royal Del Cerro. It's easily reached from, from Walnut Creek. So moving on to the areas around uh, Save Mount Diablo's Curry, Curry Canyon Ranch. In 2009, Save Mount Diablo had not yet acquired the 1,080-acre Curry Canyon Ranch property. So the BioBlitz helped provide data to justify the acquisition and apply for important Coastal Conservancy funding. In 2011, we then received special permission from the Ginocchio Ranching family to conduct our BioBlitz on two of their square mile properties that are immediately adjacent to Curry Can Canyon Ranch. The Ginocchios refer to these properties by their survey section numbers uh, called section five and section nine. And then we re returned again to the Curry Canyon Ranch area in 2012. And in fact, um, a few years later after the Morgan fire, we resurveyed these areas uh, as part of our, our fire recovery study. But I'll, I'll cover those in a moment. Curry Canyon Ranch is, is a spectacular place if, you, if you've never been there. There's a wide range of habitat types, including riparian along Curry Creek. There are several ponds and springs, both low down on the property and, and high up on the property. There's a, a deep shaded canyon running down the center of the property. Grassland ridge tops with uh, spectacular views. and a significant extension of the Knobcone Point Cliffs from Mount Diablo State Park and, uh, and heading all the way out uh, to the east toward Riggs Canyon. So we thought the prospects for a bio blitz here would be pretty good because of the variety of, of, of habitats. And here are a few examples of some of the species that we found. This was a, night, 
uh, night snake found by rancher John Ginocchio, and it was actually found on his family's land immediately adjacent to Curry Canyon Ranch. And for me, this was a really special one because this is my first light, live sighting of this species and first photograph I'd ever taken of the species. And they're just beautiful um, little snakes. Alameda whip snake, which is a species that's protected under the, the Endangered, Endangered Species Act, was found in Curry Canyon. And another protected species, California red-legged frog, was found in Curry Creek. As a birder, I was excited to find grasshopper sparrows singing from a thistle perch way up on those windswept ridges at the top of the property. And for birders, you know that grasshopper sparrows are uncommon in our area and can be very unpredictable in where you find them from year to year. We found them that one year and I haven't seen them there since. So that just shows how, what kind of enigmas they can be. The totals for our, our 2012 bio blitz at Kearney Canyon Ranch were uh, 40 experts and 737 species. And that 737 species, I believe, is the most for any of the 24 hour bio blitzes we've done so far. And then the, uh, the 2011, the previous year, we had 24 experts and 291 species. And so I think the 737 uh, species reflected the number of, of experts who participated in that 200, 2012 year. In 2017, we uh, visited Marsh Creek State Park. Marsh Creek State Park is, is currently not yet open to the, the public. It's a 3,000 acre grassland park but it's in the general planning stages and we hope it'll be open to the public sometime in the next few years. It's located in Eastern Contra Costa, Costa County, actually just across the, the road from Round Valley Regional Preserve and uh, in between Round Valley Regional Preserve and uh, the city of Brentwood. And any of you who have spent any time in Eastern Contra Costa County know that it's an area that's under intense development pressure. So documenting the region's biodiversity, this region's biodiversity is, is critical to help both us and decision makers make, make informed decisions. And this, this habitat is, is quite different than many of our other bio blitzes. It's basically an extensive grassland habitat with vernal pools and it's located right at the edge of the Central Valley. So it's, it's more like Central Valley than it is like, um, you know, the woodlands of, of Mount Diablo. It contains the floodplain of, of Marsh Creek. And you can see this was, um, was a wet year, uh, if you remember correctly. And so there's a lot of water in Marsh Creek. It would probably look very different this year. And this is one example of a locally rare species that was found at Marsh Creek State Park. Many of you are familiar with, probably familiar with the, uh, the non-native invasive fillery that you see along many of our trails. This is the native round leaf fillery um, that's found in, uh, in places like uh, Marsh Creek State Park. We, uh, we based our operations uh, for that bio blitz at Cake Bread Ranch, uh, which is located immediately adjacent to the state park. And this is a, a photo of, of some of our experts meeting to, to summarize uh, results at the end of the day. For this uh, particular bio blitz, we had 35 experts participate um, and they counted 348 species. And so now, now we get into the, uh, the really interesting bio blitzes. On a hot se September day in 2013, a wildfire was ignited on, private, on a private inholding at the northeast corner of Mount Diablo State Park. The fire burned through Perkins Canyon, save Mount Diablo's Vieira North Peak property, up into Prospector's Gap to North Peak and then to the summit. In fact, the, uh, the firefighters had to fight the flames at the summit to protect the, the uh, summit museum. 
It also burned across the eastern and southern flanks of the main peak. And by the time it was extinguished, it had burned 3,100 acres. And even before the flames had died, Save Mount Diablo began receiving requests from scientists who wanted to study the fire's impact and recovery. It was a, it was a real unique opportunity to have a fire like this in habitat like this, that's so accessible for uh, uh, people from local universities and, and others who are interested in this kind of thing. We knew there'd be a short but intense three-year period of, of what Keith Bartosh calls the fleeting abundance of fire following plants to be discovered and studied. Taking a, a step aside, Dr. Mary Bowerman co-founded um, Save Mount Diablo in 1971. And as many of you probably know, Mary was a botanist and a student of the floor of Mount Diablo for over 70 years. Her focus on science-based decision-making is ingrained in the genes of Save Mount Diablo. Save Mount Diablo had already been discussing the idea of establishing a science and research program to better honor Mary's legacy when the 2013 Morgan fire provided the impetus to kick it off. The Mary Bowerman Science and Research Program coordinates research on Save Mount Diablo properties. It administers our small grant program that provides unrestricted funds to support research on Mount Diablo and in, into the greater Diablo range. It organizes our annual bio blitz and, and Dr. Mary Bowerman Science and Research Colloquium. And if you've never attended the colloquium, we usually have it in December, early December. Um, I highly recommend you do. It's always really interesting to see the kinds of research going on around Mount Diablo and now down into the, the greater Diablo range. Really fascinating work being done. And the, the program also provides Save Mount Diablo staff and our board of directors with scientific resources to help inform our, our own decision making. So the Morgan Fire helped kick off the Mary Bowerman Science and Research uh, Program. So once the flames of the Morgan Fire had died down, it was clear where we would be holding the bio blitzes over the next three years. So in 2014, 2015, and 2016, we held the, the bio blitzes in various locations of the Morgan Fire footprint. This is a, uh, this is a map of, let me get a, this is a map of um, the area of the burn in the Morgan fire. The yellow shading is moderate intensity burning and the red shading is high intensity burning. Here is uh, the summit of Mount Diablo and here is the, the summit of North Peak. Prospector's Gap running down the middle. Perkins Canyon is down here. Um, Curry Canyon is, is down over in this direction. And in 2014 and 2015, we were really focused on the main peak down into Prospector's Gap and then a little bit up into North Peak also. Um, and then in 2016, we focused on Perkins Canyon, which was uh, very close to where the, the fire started. Former Save Mount Diablo board member, uh, Heath Bartosh is shown in this photo. Heath is a professional botanist um, who's one of, the, one of the founders of Nomad Ecology. And he has studied the effects of the Morgan fire and other fires extensively from a botanical perspective. I joined Heath on the 2014 BioBlitz. We hiked down from Devil's Elbow um, through Prospector's Gap uh, to Vieira North Peak and Ginocchio Section 5 to learn what we could could about the rare fire following plant species. And here's a few of the things that, that we found. This is a Kellogg snapdragon. We found this in the Morgan fire burn area in Perkins Canyon. Um, this particular photo was found in, was from Perkins Canyon, but they were also found in a few other places. This is a species that hadn't been seen on the mountain for 80 years. So think about that, 80 years since this, uh, this species had flowered on the mountain. This is a uh, fire poppy. And this is one of the fire followers that always seems to generate a great deal of interest from the, pub, from the public. Unfortunately, during the Morgan fire, it was found in fairly small numbers and in uh, only a few remote, very, fairly difficult to reach locations. But fortunately, we were able to document it on, on the bio blitz. 
This is woodland monolopia, another rare fire fowler. And we found this in, along the Prospector's Gap Fire Road in Mount Diablo State Park. And the Mount Diablo jewel flower, which is a Mount Diablo endemic. Now, if, if you've seen uh, Mount Diablo jewel flowers in your hikes around the mountain, um, you'll typically find them and the, they may be only a few inches tall. I've seen them on Eagle Peak where they're not even an inch tall. After the Morgan fire, they were almost shrubby due to the additional, presumably due to the additional nutrients. They were five, six, seven, eight inches tall, which, um, which was uh, really surprising and exciting to see Mount Diablo jewel flowers that large. Another fire, fire fowler that uh, was in profusion, golden eardrops here. Uh, another fire follower, whispering bells. And, you know, what, what we consider a, a fairly common plant in our area, Fremont star lily, it's a spring, spring wildflower that we normally see scattered around the edge of chaparral. Well, when the, when the, uh, the Morgan fire burned away the old growth chaparral, uh, it provided the conditions for this plant to bloom in, in profusion. And if you look carefully at this, uh, this photo, you'll see uh, Fremont star lily blooming almost as far as you can see. And in fact, in certain places, I'm thinking in the flats down below uh, Green Ranch, um, I may not be overstating when we thought there might've been a million um, Fremont star lily uh, uh, blooming there. It was just uh, an amazing spectacle to witness. So uh, to summarize the 2014 to 2016 uh, bio blitzes, in 2014, we had 33 experts and identified 583 uh, species of plants. And recall this was the bio blitz held on um, the Genocchio's property, Mount, the main peak and North Peak. Um, 2015 held in the same area we had uh, 43 experts and a fairly similar number of species, 539. And then 200, 2016, which was Perkins Canyons and Canyon and North Peak, we had 45 experts and 384 species. And I think the species count was just was lower just because the habitat isn't as diverse in that area. And so moving forward to the present. A series of lightning strikes in August 2020 ignited wildfires across the state. Locally, the Deer Zone fire burned along Marsh Creek Road and in Round Valley, Morgan Territory, and the Los Vaqueros watershed. More fires burned farther south in the Diablo Range. This set of fires, which was eventually referred to as the SCU complex, eventually burned almost 400,000 acres from August to October making it the third largest wildfire recorded in California's modern history at the time. Unfortunately, it's now the fourth largest after the 2021 Dixie fire surpassed it, but still um, a huge uh, wildfire based on um, the number of acres that burned. Once again, we have the opportunity to study fire ecology, but this time, instead of the 3,000 acres from the Morgan fire, we have almost 400,000 acres at our disposal. Uh, although much of the area that burned is on private land. And so many of our studies are on either along roadsides or in, in publicly accessible parks and, and other public areas. Like with the Morgan fire, the curtain's been pulled back on places that have previously been covered in thick old growth chaparral and brush. So there'll be a unique window of opportunity to find and identify those rare fire followers before the vegetation recovers. For the 2021 BioBlitz, we wanted to focus our efforts on the SCU complex fire zone in that first spring after the fire. Of course, uh, 2021 was also in the, in the heart of the pandemic. And so instead of tr trying to do a standard 24 hour BioBlitz where all of the, the experts get together in the same place, we decided to do something quite different, which was a dispersed BioBlitz. So, and instead of surveying a relatively small area, 
we decided to expand the study area to include the entire fire footprint of the SCU complex um, up and down the, the Diablo range. And in addition, instead of the 24 hour effort, we decided to collect observations over a two week period, allowing contributors more time to fit it into their schedule and take the time to invest the Diablo range because it can take some time to get to some of the places um, that burned in, in the SCU complex fire. Within, a two -week within that two week period, more than 100 observers participated and collected over 2,500 observations from across the Northern Di Diablo range many of which were uploaded onto iNaturalist and eBird, which was our preferred way of dealing with those large number of participants and, uh, and uh, observations. Many species were found, including rare fire, fire followers, such as fire poppy, poppies, whispering bells, and golden eardrops. In addition, participants also observed a variety of animals like stoneflies in Del Puerto Creek, uh, mountain lions in Henry Coe State Park, as well as a roadrunner and nesting golden eagles on the private Connolly Ranch, which is located near Corral Hollow. Here's one example of the type of, of explorations that took place on the 2020 BioBlitz and the, and the fact that we had the expanded area and the expanded time to, to, to do it. Uh, I joined Joan and Bruce Hamilton and if you don't know them, they're the, the folks behind our amazing uh, Audible Guide program. And I joined them on a three-day backpacking trip into the burn area of the East Bay Regional Park District's Ohlone Wilderness to investigate the impacts of the fire. I won't go into detail about everything we saw on, on those three days, but it's probably worth making a note of, of sort of our general observation on those impacts. And what we found was that in the grassland and woodland, the fire appeared to have burned with relatively low intensity. In fact, it was difficult for us to actually determine when we had reached the burn zone because the vegetation had recovered so quickly in those areas. Now, once you got into some of the chaparral areas and particularly the steep chaparral, chaparral areas, um, you could definitely notice uh, signs of more intense fire. But in general, um, at least in that area that we looked at, it was a fairly low in intensity burn. And so it's sometimes when you see the big red um, blobs of burn areas on these burns, it's really hard to know what is actually happening on the ground unless you get out there and take a look at it. There are some areas that were devastated, um, and, but a lot of the areas, it was fairly low intensity, intensity. And this is another example from the 2021 BioBlitz. Our St. Mount Diablo staff, um, put on their hiking boots and did extensive uh, explorations of the burn zone in Morgan Territory, Round Valley and the Los Fraqueros watershed. And in particularly the, the very steep slopes um, uh, in between uh, Morgan Territory and, and, uh, and Round Valley. And I've been out there a couple of times. That's a, a very difficult place to, to, to tramp around. But they were able to find a number of, of the fire followers. And in fact, they found um, the first ever record for fire poppy in this area. So obviously it had been there before um, and it probably bloomed in a previous fire, but it had never been recorded there before. So that's an example of, um, of the kind of things you can, you can amazing things you can find um, on these bio blitzes when you get out into these areas and specifically take the time to look. So the, the 2022 public bio blitz will be another dispersed effort, again, covering the SCU complex fire footprint in that what is now the, the second year of recovery after the fire. And um, the photo you see there is a photo I, I took recently of, of some of the areas that we surveyed last year. And one of the things to notice is um, the green vegetation, the green shrubs you see is Yerba Santa. Um, it's starting to grow in. Um, the poison oak starting to come back. And so the access to some of these places was a little more difficult now compared to the uh, to last year. And next year, when we do our 2023 BioBlitz, um, it's going to be even uh, more close to returning to uh, sort of normal vegetation, more difficult to get into these places. And so, you know, these years are really unique opportunities to explore. Um, explore these places and try to identify 
uh, what unique species might have, uh, have uh, germinated as a result of the conditions of the fire. And so that's the end of my pre uh, presentation about the 15 years of BioBlitz. What I'd like to do now is hand the presentation over to uh, Save Mount Diablo staff member, Denise Castro, to fill you in, in on the details of the 2022 BioBlitz. And then after we're done with that, we'll, uh, looks like we'll have time for some questions. So I am going to stop sharing. Great, thank you so much, Scott. And thank you so much everyone for joining today. Um, I'm Denise Castro. I'm St. Mount Diablo's Education and Outreach Associate. And like Scott mentioned, this year we're gonna continue to organize a two week public dispersed bio blitz. Um, similar to last year's focusing on the SU Lightning Complex fire footprint that burned over 390, yeah, 396,000 acres across the Northern Diablo Range in the summer of 2020. And um, this is gonna be our second year out of our three year study of the SCU Lightning Complex fire footprint. So we're gonna do one more year in 2023 and hopefully we'll get a good idea of fire followers and other kind of species that pop up after a massive fire. Um, but our goal for this event is um, primarily to monitor how the series of SCU fires has affected the biodiversity in different habitats by noting the kinds of things that grow or visit the burn sites. And so we wanna take notes of plants, animals, fungi, and other living things by taking photos and videos of them and uploading them onto iNaturalist. So our partner for this event is the California Native Plant Society. They've created an iNaturalist project as part of their fire followers campaign. Um, specifically for the SCU Lightning Complex fire footprint. So when you upload any photos or videos onto iNaturalist, um, those will automatically get uploaded onto that project and um, researchers and scientists can, can see that. So um, that's one reason, that's one goal for this event. The other goal is we really wanna encourage people, encourage people to get outside and to visit the Diablo range and explore. Um, so this is a great opportunity to do that um, by also getting involved in community science efforts. Um, joining is really easy. Uh, there's no signups required. You can start off by joining our iNaturalist and BioBlitz Info Night uh, next week on Wednesday, April the 13th over Zoom. And I posted a link to that along with a couple other things onto the chat. Um, so you have that information. But other than that, once you're ready to hit the road or the trail, um, just feel free to visit any of the sites that have open public access that the SCU Lightning Complex fire, um, fires pass through. And things like Morgan Territory and Round Valley Regional Preserve. So, um, and once you're out there, you just start taking pictures and photos, pictures and videos, and then uploading those onto iNaturalist. Um, yeah, we have a lot of this information. We have maps. Um, and videos on many different techniques on iNaturalist and uh, other things on our BioBlitz webpage, which I also linked on the chat. So um, yeah, that's all I have to add about this. I don't see any questions on the chat, but if you have anything you'd like to ask Scott or I, oh, so there's a question that says, isn't it a bit late given water year? Lots of flowers already out between Juniper and Mitchell Canyon two weeks ago. Yeah, um, my part of this is, or my answer to this is, it's hard to plan an event uh, when we don't really know the water situation. Hopefully we'll get another round of rains this month, but um, we, we'll see what, goes, what pops up during that time. We're not focusing on just plants. We're also focusing on insects and animals and lichen and, and other fungi. So, um, we might miss the blooming season, but hopefully we'll find some other things to focus on. Scott, I don't know if you wanted to add anything onto that. No, I mean, that's, you know, we, we set the, the bio, we have to set the bio blitz date far in advance. And as I mentioned in my presentation, um, when you set it, we'll favor some types of living things and, and not favor others because of the timing. And so <clears throat> the bio blitz is when it is, and um, we'll see what we find. Any other questions? Yeah, and Seth Adams, who's also 
as Dave Mandiablo staff member mentioned in the chat that the webinar on the 13th will teach you how to use iNaturalist. And we'll also go over more details about the 2022 BioBlitz. And his answer to the question before is different exposures and locations have very different condi conditions for wildlife. Some areas are already turning brown, other exposures are and areas are still bright green. Um, so there's still a possibility. And um, yeah, it'll still be very exciting to get out there and explore the Northern Diablo range. Um, in the case that um, anyone is unable to use the chat, oh, there's one more question here. What was the yellow flower in Scott's last slide? That was golden eardrops, which is a, one of the fire followers. Yeah, and I'll write that down in the chat here. If anyone has any questions that you can't ask at this moment, feel free to email those to me um, and I'll drop my email on the chat so you have that accessible. And I can always send those to Scott. But I think that's all we got so far. Okay, any other questions? I don't well, see any in the chat. Yeah, it looks good. Yep, thank you very much everyone for attending. Thank you so much everyone. Great, well have a great rest of your day, thank you.